meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order for the May 9th, 2016 work session of the York County School Board. Good evening. Hope everybody's having a good evening. And let's get started. Before we begin our meeting this evening, I'd like for you to uh, turn it out to Sharon. He's got a few remarks he'd like to make. Thank you, Dr. George. Board members, at this time, I want to make some comments related to an item that we're going to discuss this evening. We're still in the middle of the procurement process for the sleep pattern study for the RFP. Therefore, discussion of any particular proposal during an open meeting would not be permissible under the Virginia Public Procurement Act until after an award has been made. At this time, any discussions involving the specifics of a proposal would, not, would only be appropriate at a closed meeting pursuant to 2.2-3711A29. However, the related topic of school start times can be discussed in its place. Okay. So I need a motion to amend the agenda. All right, so um, Mr. Chairman, I move that we amend the agenda to postpone discussion of item C until we convene in a closed session later this evening, and we will discuss school start times in its place on the agenda. Second. A motion is made by Mr. Manford and seconded by Mrs. Kirsty to amend the agenda to postpone discussion of agenda item C until we convene in closed session later this evening, and we will discuss school start times in its place on the agenda. Mr. Medford? Yes. Mrs. Haywood? Yes. Mrs. Kirsty? Yes. And Dr. George? Yes. Thank you. Cool. Okay, we have several presentations lined up. The first one pertains to our breakfast and lunch prices for the 2016-17 school year. Dr. Shannon, would you like to take it from here? Thank you, Dr. George. I'm going to ask Albert Green, Associate Director of School Administration, to come to the podium. He's going to share background and contextual information regarding the need for an increase of 10 cents to breakfast and lunch prices for the York County School Division for 2016-2017 school year. Mr. Green. Thank you, Dr. Shander. Good evening, Dr. George, members of the board, and Dr. Shander. Tonight I will provide background and contextual information regarding proposed changes to the prices of breakfasts and lunches for the 2016-2017 school year. You will also find a chart with comparative meal prices and increases from surrounding school divisions in your folders. This slide provides information regarding current lunch prices for elementary and secondary students as well as the amount of reimbursement received by the division from the federal government for each type of lunch served. As you can see, the current price for a paid lunch is $2.50 for elementary students and $2.60 for secondary students. In addition, the division is reimbursed $0.29 cents for a paid meal, $2.67 for a reduced meal, and $3.07 for a free meal. The, dif the difference in the amount of reimbursement for a paid meal and a free meal is $2.78. Federal regulations re require school divisions to adjust lunch prices if they charge less than $2.78 for a paid lunch during the 2015-2016 school year. There are two ways to meet the federal requirement. Increase paid meal prices or utilize other non-federal funds to supplement the nonprofit school fund food service account. <clears throat> the amount of the adjustment is determined by using the paid lunch equity tool provided by the Virginia Department of Education. By using this tool, it has been determined that a 15 cent increase in the price of breakfast and lunch is required. However, since the law caps breakfast and lunch increases at 10 cents each year, we are recommending a 10 cent increase to breakfast and lunch prices for the 2016-2017 school year. This table provides information about the current meal prices for elementary <clears throat> students as well as recommended meal prices for the 2016-2017 school year. Please note that reduced meal prices will remain the same, 30 cents for breakfast and 40 cents for lunch. The milk price will also remain 55 cents. This chart provides information about current meal prices for secondary students, as well as the recommended meal prices for the 2016-2017 school year. Again, please note that reduced meal prices and milk prices will remain the same for secondary students as well. You will notice in the comparative meal price chart from surrounding school divisions in your folders 
that most surrounding school divisions, including Pocosin, Newport News, and Williamsburg, James City County, are increasing lunch prices by 10 cents. A request for approval of the proposed meal prices for next year will come before the board at the next regular meeting on May 23rd. Are there any questions? I don't have a question about the price, but I do have a question to make sure that we're following up on the quality of food that we're providing students. Uh, are the principals doing that, school board staff? How are we um, checking to ensure that Sodexo is providing the quality that we would expect? I can give you one particular example of that sort of thing. We, we had uh, a complaint about one particular item at one of our schools. And uh, Sodexo actually went out to use that as a training opportunity. And when they actually arrived, the actual cafeteria manager at that school was already using it as a learning experience, as a, a training opportunity. So anytime we have any of those concerns, we use them as training opportunities. In addition, um, students, if they're unhappy with their meal, they can return it and they will replace it immediately. I'm just going to rhyme in like I always do reference to this. Um, when you started off your presentation with federal regulation, <laughs> um, un unfortunately we've seen what that has done in some cases to food service across the country and schools with just the regulatory pressure that our, well in this case, private vendor is under to provide the meals for our students. Um, it's also concerning, though, as we continue to see us to, for us to be able to meet a regulation, we have to continue to raise our prices on the people that can't afford to buy their lunches to a point at some point they're going to stop buying, and that's a concern. Um, I'm glad we have the federal lunch program to provide for the free and reduced population that we have in our school district, but at the same time, at some point it's going to break. If, that, if we continue having to raise our price because of a regulation that says we must raise our price because we've got to be within a, a squeeze of a, of a window. Um, so I hope we don't reach that point. I know that Sodexo has done a fantastic job getting participation up across the division, even with the breakfast program um, in the classroom that got started and, and really kicked off this year. So um, a lot of good things happening. I just hate to see the rug pull out from under this whole thing because the prices get to a point where the parent finally says, we're just going to pack and send it to school. And my only comment, similar kind of comment, I understand all of this. I'm coming down out of a, uh, the town hall meeting but we've gone to each of the schools and to speak on behalf of Bruton, there was concern about the flavor of food and we had to go into the federal regulations and the low calorie, low salt and, and sugar and so forth. Um, I asked the group and I know that's just a percentage of the students that come into our, the town hall meeting, but I asked how many uh, purchased lunches, maybe a third, of the hands went up when I asked how many brought lunches from home, <clears throat> maybe another third, and then I didn't ask, well, are you eating lunch? But uh, I would, if at all possible, follow up with the schools, especially, and I can speak to Bruton, I, I'm not sure about the other mm -hmm. three, just to say, we've heard you. And I, I put a lot that day on Sodexo, working with us and so forth, so. Just to say, we heard you. We, we, that came out of the town hall meeting. These are the kinds of things that uh, we want to follow up, if, if at all possible, because these kids were very, very bad kids. The students were very, very, um, they did, I enjoyed the town meeting because of the issues that they raised and in the professional manner in which they did so as students. Barbara, to piggyback on that too, <laughs> Is, I know some school districts across the country have done this. We you know our, our high schoolers are, we live in a, a, this cashless society. So uh, where a lot of our, our teens in schools, the ones that have jobs or work or have, they don't bring cash to school. And some school districts have moved to a point of sale where they're actually taking debit or, you know, they're, they're check cards basically to purchase an a la carte item or lunch because if they're hungry that day, chances are they don't have cash and they probably don't have money in that food account. Um, is there any way we can look at that opportunity? Um, is it allowed, first of all? Um, and if it is, could that also increase participation maybe um, on either a la carte or lunch at our secondary school? Yes, sir. 
car, do you know if that's allowed? Or? Well, we'll certainly investigate that and see what our opportunities are because you are right, it is a cashless society. Right. And our students do use technology, so we'll see what opportunities are available. Yeah, because if it is available, technology. even if we ran a test at one of the schools just to see if that bump participation up because now they can go get something to their... They under. have a system now by which long as money is put on their account, they but, don't have to... But it takes 24 get, hours for it to post. It's not an immediate posting. So, because um, they have to upload that information Correct. from uh, my lunch money account thing. At least that's what it used to be. Well, that might cool be saying. something you could promote at the beginning of the school year to even if you don't plan on eating in the cafeteria every day, maybe you want to put $20 on that account and then you can buy a la carte during the school year. I know at, at the universities that's what they do with their ID. You have your lunch account and then you've got a separate account that might cost a little bit more for a la carte different places. Right, but that's a good suggestion for us to look into is how we can make it more available to students, and easier for students to, to buy lunch. So we'll take a look at that. All right, thank you. We had the same same question at TAP. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> High school, same comment about the food. You know, it's, it's like if you take out the, the fat and the carbs mm -hmm. and the... the <laughs> Uh, the calories and the salt, it's, it's tofu, basically. <laughs> so, well, I mean, it, 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 I, I can imagine it's not, it's not good, but I don't know. Anything on the horizon that would loosen up some of those regulations? Is there talk about that? That's possible. Well, it's also the presentation of the food, too. The picture you're talking about was sent to me after the town hall for, forum at Grafton by a student who had raised concerns about the lunch program. And then she took a picture of her lunch and sent it to me, and I forwarded it on to you guys, and we didn't know it was a cheeseburger. Well, I use that opportunity to say, I'm sitting down here and I got two members of the Board of Supervisors sitting here. I want you all to be healthy. The nurse part is talking to you now. So you all need to be healthy now and not get to our age and deal with high blood pressure, cholesterol issues and diabetes, and they just looked and laughed. But anyway, the point I was trying to make, it's there for a reason early on to get started early. You just got to have a certain, I, uh, certain test I, I know my too. cohorts on the Board of Supervisors love me for saying yeah. that to the students, but anyway. I think the educational uh, aspects you're talking about are, yeah. are correct, but 180 lunches a yeah. year is not yeah. going to correct yeah. childhood yeah. obesity, but the educational side of things yeah. can. Um, Happy meeting, That's all yeah. yeah. different debate there. So. Yeah. All right. Any more questions for Mr. Green? No, we tore that one. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate Green. that. Thank you. Good job. Okay, Dr. Shannon. Next. All right. Our next presentation uh, is going to be on instructional capacity and rebalancing attendance zones. Dr. Guy and Dr. James are going to provide information regarding the methodology used in the calculation of instructional capacities for elementary schools. Dr. James is then going to provide some additional information on increasing enrollment in elementary schools and the balancing of the elementary attendance zones. Dr. James and Dr. Guy. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. Tonight, as Dr. Shandor stated, Dr. Guy and I will share information with you regarding building capacity and instructional capacity. When I speak of building capacity, that's a term that typically used to reflect the number of students who can be effectively enrolled in a building at a certain point in time. But as we know, as buildings age, our instructional program change, and our methodology change, perhaps that building is not as effective in meeting the number of students that were, it was first designed to meet. So with that, we are working with uh, another measure called instructional capacity that talks about the number of students that can be enrolled in a school under the current program of studies or the current instruction program. As that changes, then our requirements need to change. I also want to share with the board that whenever we calculate building capacity or instructional capacity, we're not including portable classrooms in that capacity. The measure that we are using to determine building capacity was developed by Dr. Glenn Earthman from Virginia Tech. He's been to the school division twice once in 1992 for first calculation, and then he came back again in 2004 and did another calculation. That's mainly because instructional programming changed during those 12 years, and we need to take another look at it. The methodology that he did in 2004 is what we currently use, because as you know, we've added a number of additions to our elementary schools. So whenever we add an addition, that increases our capacity, but we still use the same numbers that Dr. Earthman used for us in 2004. If you look at this particular chart, it shows the particular calculation. And this is talking about an average ratio of students per grade level. 
I know the board regularly sees say, well, those are not our averages now. Again, it's the point things have changed since 2004, but our current capacities are based on this particular calculation. So you can see at kindergarten, we are speaking of 20 students per classroom, grades one and two, 22 students per classroom, grades three to five, 25, and then middle school, grades six through eight, and high school, grades nine through 12, is still 25 students per classroom. So if a school only had four classrooms and you're in high school, their capacity would be 200, four classrooms times 25. Just looking at the classroom and, and doing multiplying to get what the building capacity would be. And that's how the building capacity is determined. Any questions about that calculation? I, I do have to say this because I know that my friends who are teachers in third, fourth, and fifth grade will say, I've got more than 25 kids in my class. Students, I keep calling them kids. Too. Right, yes. <laughs> 25 students in my class. I've got 29. So just so the public is aware that we, we know we do have some classes that are larger than 25. Thank you for making that clarification, Ms. Kirsten, because it is true where well, the number of students enrolled in a particular class, but when we did building capacity back in 2004, those were the ratios that we used. So there are two different measures that we're speaking of here. Again, you know, that number is not static, the number of students that could be accommodated in a building. It's going to change. The point is how the building is utilized, what programming we'll be having in school, then what mandated or other educational practices that have changed since we last calculated the capacity. So that led us to instructional, or what I like to refer to sometimes as functional capacity. How does the building function well with a certain number of students? Because of the number of students in that school and the number of programs within that school. So with that, we know, and we're speaking about elementary schools, there are many programs in elementary schools beyond a typical K-5 classroom. And these programs, as you can see on the screen here, art, computer labs, dance, and drama. When our schools were constructed, computer labs were not something we had in the schools, but now we need computer labs, as Dr. Guy would tell us, because we need those for SOL testing and also for instruction. We have magnet schools, Walter Mill, dance and drama, LEP, or limited English proficiency, math resource at Yorktown Elementary, pre-kindergarten classes. That's a very important part of what we do. Reading, science resource at Yorktown Elementary, special education, and we have two types of special ed programs, either pull-out or a self-contained model, and Dr. Guy will speak to that later. You also see on the slide that we talk about uh, instructional program capacity is not calculated for secondary schools because of the way those schools are utilized. That's far different than what you see in elementary schools. Over there. <laughs> Next, Dr. Guy described to you the uh, methodology we use in calculating instructional capacity. Oh. Did you go back one? Thank you, Dr. James. The previous calculation looked at the number of classroom spaces available for K-5 instruction and compared it to what was needed to meet enrollment demands. It did not consider the need for instructional spaces based on the various instructional programs in our elementary schools, such as computer labs for SOL testing. None of our elementary schools were built with a designated computer lab. However, we're required to deliver SOL testing online. We typically convert our libraries into computer labs in May, but we also need the space, um, the converted classroom, to serve as a computer lab. Growth in preschool programs. In the past five years, our preschool program has grown from 72 to 97 students with disabilities. On the surface, 25 students with disabilities may not appear to be a large jump. However, preschool teachers are restricted to an eight to one student to teacher ratio for students with disabilities, which means the equivalent of three additional teachers and three additional classrooms for those 25 students. Our magnet programs also require additional classroom space. For example, as a math and science magnet, Yorktown Elementary School has a math and science resource teacher, both of whom require classroom spaces. As I shared, previous calculations did not capture the instructional impact when programs like art or music had to be pushed onto the stage, a cart, or into a portable classroom to make room for a K-5 classroom. 
As a result, it was not accurately reflecting what, where we already had known capacity concerns. Many of our elementary schools were also built without sufficient space for pullout services for special education, limited English proficiency students, or reading services. As a result, many schools carry out these services in hallways, converted closets, and principal conference rooms. And again, the previous calculation did not account for these programs being delivered in non-instructional spaces. Additionally, these numbers have grown dramatically over the past 10 years. Since 2006, the number of LEP students receiving services has more than doubled from 143 students to 298 students. And most of those are at the elementary level. The number of students with disabilities has increased by 8% 8% since 2006, from 1,234 students to 1,337 students, or an additional 103 students. Likewise, the percentage of economically disadvantaged students in the division has also increased significantly in the past 10 years, from 13.6% in 2006 to 20.6% today. At our Title I schools, we have three Title I schools, Dare Elementary, Bethel Manor Elementary, and Magruder Elementary, and Yorktown Elementary, which is a skip school. That is an increase of 242 students at those four schools alone. As a result, this has had a significant impact on the need for additional reading specialists and the need for the space to provide these services. So, our, so this is all background information into why we had to um, recalculate this. Our revised formula takes all of these aspects into account. So I'm going to talk about the pullout services, the LEP, the reading, um, the special education services. As you take a look at this, classroom, we had to calculate what spaces are needed for this so that we're not providing them in the hallway and as I said before, in converted closets. So what we did is if you look at the very first column there, past the school names, we calculated that classroom space for LEP services or the equivalent, we needed a half a classroom in every building to provide those services. We also did the same thing with reading, excuse me, with reading services, the equivalent of half, half a classroom space, but we calculated it based on the number of reading specialists in the building. So for example, Bethel Manor has four reading specialists, so the classroom space equivalent for reading services would be two classrooms. We also did the same for special education, but with special education, typically services are going to be provided in smaller groups when you pull out special education students. So we calculated that at one-third the classroom space and multiplied that by the number of special education teachers in a building. But all elementary schools also provide speech services. So we also calculated one-third classroom space for the speech services, and that goes into that number. We then added those numbers up. So we added up the total space required for LEP services, the total space required for reading services, and the total space required for special education services. And that gives us the figure with the arrow at the bottom, the second arrow at the bottom, classroom space for pullout services combined. Now recognizing that many of our elementary schools do have some pullout spaces, just insufficient pullout spaces, Dr. James, Mr. Shearhart, and I went through every building and looked at the small pullout spaces, not counting closets, not counting the stage, not counting principal conference rooms or teacher work rooms, the spaces that were designed for small pullout services. And then what we did, you'll see that as the next column, and we subtracted the small pullout space equivalent that they had from what they needed to provide that service. And that's where you come up with the last two columns in blue. For example, looking at Bethel Manor again, Bethel Manor requires 1.4. Well, you can't use 0.4 of a classroom to provide pullout services if it's needed and also use it as a regular classroom space. So anywhere that we were at 0.3 or above, we rounded up. And so you see that for Bethel Manor, in addition to all the small pullout spaces, if you wanted to provide these services in an instructional environment, not in a hallway, they would need to use two classroom spaces to provide those pullout services. So this is part one of the formula. It's determining the amount of pullout spaces required 
and you have gone school by school to look at the specific school by school. needs based on the student population that they have now. Absolutely. Their needs are. And that's why we use for reading services and for special education services, we use the number of reading specialists and special education teachers because those are based on um, the number of students that receive those services in those buildings. So then we go to part two. So what we look at now is we look at a building and we look at the number of regular classrooms that that building has. So this building has 37 classrooms, regular classrooms. We then start our classroom deduction for special programs. So every elementary school, the art teacher, the music teacher, and a computer lab should all require classroom space. So we're going to deduct three for those three spaces. If the school has a magnet program, and this one, for example, has a math and science program, we're going to deduct the classroom spaces required to provide those <coughs> services. If they have a preschool program in their building, we're going to deduct that from the total number of classrooms. This building has one preschool pro uh, classroom. And then we're going to go back to that previous sheet that I just went through with you and look at the pullout space required to provide the services. This building needs <coughs> four pullout spaces in addition to any four classroom pullout spaces in addition to what they already have in their building. And actually, and then last on the deduction is if they have any special, um, excuse me, any self-contained special education classrooms. And so this building does not have any self-contained classrooms. So you've got a total of 10, and then that's deducted from the regular classroom spaces available in that building. So that brings us down to 27. We then multiply by 22.5, which is the average students per classroom. So what we've done is we have a ratio of 20 to 1 for K through second grade, and we have a ratio of 25 to 1 third through fifth, so that is 22.5. And so for this building, the instructional capacity is 608 students. Now the building we're looking at here is Yorktown Elementary School, and the actual enrollment at Yorktown is 699. So, excuse me, K-5, not including preschool because we've taken preschool out with that, with that measure. So again, taking a look at this, this takes into account when we've pushed things out of the classroom into non-instructional spaces. I want to share with you that we believe this methodology is better for the following reasons. It recognizes that once programs like art and music are pushed onto the stage, a car or a portable classroom due to the classroom space being needed for K through 5 classroom services, it's an indication that the building has exceeded its instructional capacity. It recognizes that services for our students that require additional support should not be occurring in hallways or closets. It's flexible to the changing needs of the student population at each building. If the number of special education students go up in a building, the number of special education teachers increases, which is then reflected in the formula with the number of pullout spaces required. The same is true for reading services. And when additions are built with small pullout resource rooms, sorry about that, the formula can quickly and easily take that into account, reducing the need for regular classrooms to be used for pullout services. And last but not least, it provides consistency and transparency for our community. Do y'all have any questions about the new formula? Uh, I have one question about how you calculate um, the number of students, LEP or special ed. Um, do you see any kind of trend whereas more of those students are at one or two elementary schools versus others so we can make sure that those elementary schools are receiving the additional support that mm -hmm. they need? We do. Um, in fact, um, Coventry is one of our elementary schools that has a larger LEP population. They were one of the first elementary schools that we shifted from tutors to a teacher. Um, in, the, in the proposed budget, uh, we have additional teachers in the budget for LEP because we're required by the um, federal government to move from tutors to teachers. And so our first teachers will be going into um, additional elementary schools. I can tell you Tab Elementary is one of them. Magruder is another, and Yorktown is the third elementary school. So those are the schools that have the larger LEP populations right now. This is a lot of hard work, and it looks really good. 
<clears throat> and I want to echo that because I think I asked you before, how did you come up with your formula? Because uh, it would, if there was something that from a conference, something from a textbook, but you had indicated this was something that you've done specifically for your county. Mm -hmm. And I said congratulations with this because as we did the budget and you, you heard different people in the community saying building versus instructional capacity and there are two different numbers and you got to get your facts straight. This tells you instructional capacity and instructional programs is where, what we are all about mm -hmm. and how we meet the needs of all of our students. So that's a lot of hard work has gone to this and I thank you for it. Yeah, I think y'all should patent it. Um, <laughs> no, the SBA uh, workshop. Yeah, they're, they're exactly. But at the same time, it creates, I think, a level of depth that we can argue when we get into talking about CIP growth, new building, things like that, because you you can't argue this. I mean, somebody can sit there and argue all day long if they want, but they're just they're a waste of time because these data points prove to anyone willing to take a look at it, simply to say the building's reach just instructional capacity or gone way beyond where um, now we're going to see possibilities for problems in the instructional area. So, good job. Thanks. I mean, you said that <clears throat> you know that you've reached instructional capacity when one or more is moved into a closet space, a stage, or is that, is that correct? Just even one kind yeah, of tells you because if you're moving the art room out of the classroom onto the stage, you're moving it because you need another classroom right. space. So that's an indication that you, you're having capacity issues right then and there. So I think the thing that you're going to see when Dr. James shares the numbers in just a moment is that they reflect what we know. They reflect what you all have seen when you've gone into buildings with the Board of Supervisors and you've seen programs that are being offered on the stage at the same time that we've got lunch running in a cafeteria. I, I like to know that, that, that up front they're going to determine that up front that this is where we are. I went with Tom Shepard to York, Yorktown Elementary and I'll never forget, this was what, two, three months ago mm -hmm. when we all went with our counterparts. Um, <clears throat> and we went into the, the cafeteria which has a stage in it and there's you know a couple of kids up there reading and I said well what are they doing I said well they have difficulty reading they need extra help in reading so they're on the stage in this incredibly noisy uh, room where everybody's eating and I thought this makes no sense whatsoever these are the kids that need more help with reading and they're up there on that stage and it just uh, I was very very pleased that uh, you know Tom was there with me to see that and I think we you know, until you see it in action, you don't realize how disruptive that is. So, thank you. Thank you. Very good discussion. The next chart I have for you is a comparative chart that gives you the building capacity in the second column that's based on the methodology I first spoke about. The third column gives you our original instructional capacity that we've used for a couple of years, but it didn't reflect all the things Dr. Guy talked about. And the fourth column now gives us the revised instructional capacity, and that's based on the methodology that Dr. Guy spoke about. The fifth column gives us the enrollment at the end of last month. And, of course, the last column gives us the percent capacity. This is comparing revised instructional capacity to K-5 enrollment. Now, when you talk about capacity, how well does a building function? How much flexibility can you have in a building? If you're within 85 to 90 percent of the capacity, then you know you have some flexibility as program change, as more students enroll, you perhaps would not have the situation that we just discussed about students being on the stage or in a trailer or on, or in the gymnasium for instructional purposes. That's why that 85 to 90 percent is a very good marker. If you see here at our schools, you can see a number of them are beyond the instructional capacity because of the number of students that are enrolled there. And we're speaking of K-5 enrollment here. And you can see the ones that are above it. Magruder, Walla Mill, Walla Mill especially, because as you know, there's a 10 classroom addition on the way at Walla Mill. The building capacity and the revised instructional capacity will change when those 10 classrooms are complete and the entire building is now fully functional. So we'll do that as we go down the road when those classrooms are completed. And you can also see Yorktown Elementary, and you look at uh, the revised instructional capacity, the number of students, and where we are 
percentage-wise as far as capacity is, is concerned. So as you can see here, we have a number of schools that are over and some that are beyond the 90% capacity. They're not up above it, but they're getting pretty close. And as we know, those are the ones, some of those schools, we have new developments in those communities. And later on, I'll talk about, based on the projected number of students for those new developments, how that capacity number is going to change because of that increased enrollment. Any questions about that particular chart? I can also share with you, when we talk about their elementary school, the extend center is not part of the building capacity number. Sometimes community members will see all of those classrooms and say you have plenty of room. But there are a number of classrooms there that are dedicated to extend and they're not part of the K-5 program at DARE. And Walla Mill, we talked about the 10 classroom addition too that will increase once that happens. Any questions about that chart? Do you have any kind of ball? park figure on what Waller Mill, um, what the capacity will be once the 10 classrooms are complete? Right. Yeah, there are 10 classrooms, but one is subdivided in two smaller rooms. So we'll take, and they're all upper grade classrooms, so those nine classrooms have 25. I think there's going to be 225, and that'll increase it by 225. Okay, moving on. Now we have the capacity dis dis discussion. Let's talk about the future. It seems like every time I bring this chart to you and you have a full-size one in your packet, every time I bring this chart to you, I've added a new development. One we just added last week, and that's Burgess's Quarters. Many of you know where that is. The 1776 hotel that was located on Bypass Road has now been converted to timeshare as a part of it, but in the very center of it, they're going to build a townhome community. I talked to the developer last week, and they tell me they expect some students in the fall but, however, we'll see what happens. But we can expect 18 more students at Walla Mill because of this town home community. So it looks like the development is going to be pretty aggressive, but we don't know that yet until they have actually completed that development. So that's another one with the, all the others that we have talked about with many of our elementary schools. So I've taken the same chart I shared with you earlier. I've added projected enrollment based on the new developments. The number of students that the County Planning Department tells us we should expect at full build-out. Some of those developments will complete sooner than others. We know from this past year, Yorktown Arch is very quick as far as build-out, and Nelson's grant that started before Yorktown Arch is still not fully build-out. So it just depends on what happens to each developer and his community, what happens. But you can see here, again, I've now added Grafton Bethel to the mix of schools that can be over capacity because of Commonwealth Green and also the townhomes at Martin's Farm. There's two developments there. Um, we've also added Seaford with that one because coming before the board at the end of the month, it's going to be a proposal to rezone the Yorktown Crescent to the Seaford zone, and that's going to increase enrollment at Seaford as well as there's another active development in the Seaford Zone, Osborne Landing, that will bring more students to us from that community. Walla Mill, we just talked about Burgess's Quarters, but we also know the reserve there off Moortown Road. They've almost completed all of the single family homes. I think they're, they're all are under roof and they're completing seven, so they'll be complete. And talking with the County Planning Department today, permits have gone forward, so pretty soon they'll start to build the townhomes on the other side of that development. That's also Walla Mill, so you know that's going to be an impact there. And York Elementary, we know we have a number of developments in the Yorktown Elementary Zone that's going to increase the capacity there. So as you see going forward, we have some schools that are really quite far over capacity as far as percentage is concerned. Any questions about that particular one? So as we think about capacity, as we think about our schools, what do we need to do to balance it across the division? As you know, we spoke about this earlier back in March. What options would the board have to adjust attendance zones? And there are two. One, we're just using for the Yorktown Crescent, that area I just spoke about, is to uh, have a, several public meetings and then bring a recommendation forward to the board. The superintendent will submit that to you to rezone that particular area to another school location. But the other option is, would be to convene a representative committee to study enrollment across the division and then come up with a long-term solution to how we need to address capacity across all of our elementary schools, especially. 
And our recommendation is that we use option two starting next fall to study enrollment and capacity issues across all of the elementary schools and then determine how best to balance the enrollment for all 10 of our elementary schools. Any questions about that particular process? Would option two also include um, possibly a third party component? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Bedford, for bringing that up. We're in the process of obtaining and put, we're putting out an RFP to obtain a consultant to come in and review all of this information with us uh, to study our attendance zones, to provide us um, a few options as we're moving forward, a few different scenarios when we're looking across all, all 19 of our schools. So that, that's, uh, I think, an important component that the community needs to understand as well as um, all of our staff members to bring in that third party component to work with our team to bring those options forward. Would they, oh, sorry. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to follow up by saying that sometimes when people hear rezoning or balancing the tenant zones, it can, it can create anxiety levels within our communities. But I think the important piece is to remember there's so many different things playing in this, this and having a third party look at it, it's actually a, a really good idea, but committee also. But with all the growth, a new school, and just the fact that in some cases things have been patched and moved over the years because we've had to adjust and move things um, here and there, this might be that time when, when the whole entire county gets looked at, analyzed, researched, you know, input from others, you're not going to make everybody happy when you do a rezone. Uh, when you open a new school, you're not going to make everybody happy. But what's best for the entire infrastructure and YCSD or in, in the, our entire community because even potential growths that haven't gone online yet would probably play into the fact that, you know, how do you move things and, and adjust things. So it should be interesting to see how all this plays out. Well, we're going to have to have a new elementary school attendance zone. Um, yeah. The other attendance zones, I see possibly tweaks. I, you know, like you said, I don't think that it's anything that should um, cause major concern to most parents. I think you know if you live, like in my district, Coventry is definitely surrounded by neighborhoods. You're not going to send them to up the street to Grafton Bethel or something like that. Um, Kiln Creek would probably like for their area to be looked at because they do have a long bus ride up 17. But one area of concern I have, we know the new developments are coming, but I remember Mr. Cross saying at one of the meetings last year that he was expecting an increase of young families moving into existing homes. So would this um, third party look at resales of homes and how many families are moving into the different uh, attendance zones or are we doing that now or how are we monitoring that? Mm -hmm. take that on. Right. Sure, we're constantly in contact with Mr. Cross, see what they can tell us. And we need multiple data points when we look at this rezone and the county planning staff and what they can tell us about resale homes and what we can tell to kind of factor that in. What percentage have we seen over the past years? And I don't know if he has that number now, but what have we seen, the typical three-year average of move-ins, I always use that term, for lack of a better term, move-ins compared to new homes and all of that. But as I've heard, a lot of empty nesters are now selling their homes okay. to young families, so well, the cycle continues. Up, and I followed up, I did a little research and actually reached out to a real estate agent as I was pulling up today, just you know, asking some questions. And right now, the inventory of homes, single-family homes in York County are it's, it's shallow, it's not a lot right now. Um, townhomes and such are, you can find those more frequently, but the single family home market is a buyer's market out there right now as far as, I'm not buyer seller's market out there right now, um, which that can change in a, in a, in a, in a breeze, but is that, that true? Because as people sell their homes, <clears throat> these older homes do sell a lot less expensive than newer homes. Right, and that's a hard one to figure out. It really is. The one thing I would add to that, uh, going back to your very last chart that looked at the projected enrollment and new developments and how that plays a part, we talked the other day about how this today's meeting would uh, be revisited on TV for folks who are not here, who are not looking at it live, and when it would be replayed. I know we had seen some old um, 
board meetings, not the revised ones, so making sure that um, the newer meetings are being seen. But it's important for the community to understand this calculation and to understand the importance in the numbers because I believe we're, we have some valid good data here that will lend to future planning. When I look at especially Magruder Elementary and Yorktown Elementary with the projected enrollments and where that percent capacity is, and we're, we're about quality education for all of our students, and with this percentage this high, we're not, we're not going to accomplish that. So um, we need a new school. That's the bottom line. But at the same time, we need to look at drawing the attendance lines, but at the same time, keeping the enrollment down based on the instructional numbers, not the building capacity numbers. But it's, this is important for the community to understand and digest. There was one other statistic, and Dr. Jens, I'm sure if you brought that with you. Our, when, from 2006 to 2016, I think it's important to note that our elementary population, and I'll share this with board members in Friday notes, we were able to pull this information, um, has grown by, by around 400 students. So just, at, and that's just at the elementary level. So we've seen a pretty significant shift of population of kids from 10 years ago. We have 400 more elementary students, and obviously middle is, is lower and, and high school is lower. That's a very good point to make because a lot of times you'll hear in the community, well, your enrollment is staying stagnant. You, you haven't really increased, but that's good. Let's repeat that. Right. The enrollment of elementary school children has increased over the last 10 years, while middle school and high school has decreased, causing us to have what appears to be a stagnant enrollment figure. Yeah. But elementary education, the elementary students, that number has increased. I think we really need to uh, make sure everyone is aware of that. And I'll share that statistic in Friday notes this week. Anyone else? Uh, one more question. With the uh, RFP and the third party, would they also look at um, bus routes? Because I know that's one thing when you're talking about attendance zones and you're, you're thinking, like, in my neighborhood, it's probably a two-minute bus ride to Coventry Elementary School. Kiln Creek has a longer bus ride to Grafton Bell. So will they be looking at the bus routes? Right. As I think about crafting that RFP and what the scope of work is going to be, this is a great opportunity to include that because you're looking at part of it anyway, so why not look at the full scope of all of the bus routes and determine <clears throat> as much as we can what the zones will be going forward so we don't have to come back and revisit this again. I think that's a good I idea. I think it's incredibly important that we, that we implement that and incorporate that with our um, RFP. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Guy, Dr. James. Appreciate that. Uh, we're going to move on to school start times. Dr. Shander, you have a few moments or yes. a few briefs? Yep. Thank you, Dr. George. So, uh, again, I'm going to turn this back over to Dr. James, and he's going to re review some information about school start times. Um, primarily, he's going to review some of the information and some of the options that were presented, presented to the board. Um, I believe in the very last presentation when, when you all were reviewing this topic and looking at options from 2013. So I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Chan. Yeah, thanks to Dr. Chan. As you may recall, in uh, June of 2013, we started the discussion about school start times. At that time, there were six scenarios presented to the board for consideration, and we worked through those six scenarios. One of those scenarios included combining middle and high school routes to give us more, to make a later start time for both. But in that, we looked at what cost us about $970,000 because of the need for additional buses. But we moved on from there, and the six scenarios became six cost-neutral options, which involved delaying the start times by 30 minutes for each level and or changing the traditional sequence of high school first, middle school second, and elementary schools last. After that discussion, the six options were then narrowed to four options. Options A, B, C, and D, as you may remember. And from options A, B, C, and D, we came up with options C and D. And in these, it was still delaying the start times by 30 minutes for the first tier, 
which would then push it back 30 minutes for the second and third tier. But at that time, when we left it, and I'll bring back, and I will bring forward to you. <laughs> okay, uh, option C and D. And option C and D, and I'll just close that one out. The one I'm looking for is not there now. So with that in mind, option C and D, and option C and D, it basically had elementary schools starting first around 750, with middle schools starting at 910, and high schools starting at 830. And that was a cost neutral one, but it wasn't one that involved actually actually increasing costs, it was just changing the rotation and pushing them back by 30 minutes. And this was compared to the 2013-2014 bell schedule of school operating hours. As you know, since then, we have changed the elementary start times. So as you can see here, option C is the one that was most preferred at that time, and those are the particular times that we used uh, simply by moving them back 30 minutes but moving elementary first at 750. Any questions about that particular chart with what option C had for us at that time? And the last time we discussed this was in December 2013. So from the December 2013 meeting, it was decided that the next steps would be gathering feedback from our parents, from our students, and from our staff. And that's where we uh, left this discussion back in 2013 in December. Any questions? I think it's time we pick up and move forward with the taking it to the community and how we can do a survey that would um, help <clears throat> us see what parents want. Um, I think the biggest concern, I know for me, because each of the five districts are very, very different in this layout of students and just the, the movement throughout the, uh, those districts is that as we do a survey, as, as the staff moves forward with the survey, that we try to receive uh, a good response back. I don't know what percentage we want to identify, but long as it's an equal percentage as much as possible across all five districts. But I think uh, it's worth moving forward to, to do a survey. I think you have to um, craft the survey in a way where you don't have someone for and someone against battling it out by com uh, completing the survey numerous times and uh, skewing your results. Yeah, that can be so you, you have to um, work that out. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I definitely support surveying the parents and the students and staff to find out what the needs are, the desires, um, any obstacles that may need to be fixed. I think everyone knows that I believe that return to um, an eight o'clock or after start time would benefit the students, and I think this could be one of the most important decisions that I make on this board, that this board makes. Um, you know, I was watching a movie about concussions with Will Smith, and I was thinking about the school start time issue and how they didn't want to acknowledge, the NFL coaches, the public didn't want to acknowledge that concussions could cause brain damage. And the football players then finally, they accepted it, but it was a long road, long path to get there. And it reminded me of the school start time issue because so many people wear a lack of sleep as a badge of honor. Oh, I only need four or five hours of sleep. And, and they don't really consider that we spend or we should spend a third of our <coughs> lifetime asleep, that it serves a purpose. And if we don't sleep, we die. So um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Center for Disease Control, had, you know, it took a lot for both of those organizations to come out and rec recommend a school start time for middle school and high school at 8.30. Now that's an hour and 10 minutes later than what we have now. We have the earliest start time in the state. I think now is the time to move this forward. So um, I appreciate everything staff has done up until this point, and uh, I'm ready to go. A lot has happened. I'm, I'm sorry, but a lot has happened since 13. We have a new superintendent. We, we made a lot of changes around here, so.
And I, in all fairness to him, it's like we, we just put a halt until we did. His and, um, and I'm not going to dispute findings and research um, because it's there, the documents are there, um, their research is there for anybody to take the time to read. Um, I kind of step back and I go, okay, we have a I don't know if I'd call it an issue. It's, it's, we have an option as a school district to set our times of when our students go to school. Um, I think you've had eight people maybe come before us recently over the past months or so, um, some of them repeatedly um, voice a concern or bring up an op a, 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 something reference this topic. And then over the time when our new superintendent was transitioning in, it was right after we tabled, well, it was months after we tabled this um, until we had the new superintendent on board. But I didn't, I haven't heard this loud outcry yet. So I guess for me, yes, moving forward with finding out what the will of the people are, and I say people because yes, the parents need to rhyme in here or chime in and, and, and um, make sure they're heard. But it's the customer, it's the student. I really want to hear what the high schoolers are going to say. I really, really look forward to finding out how they will feel if they go to school later, whether it's 30 minutes or 40 minutes or an hour, and get out an hour later. How will that response be? What are we going to do as a board if it's a 50-50 or 49-51%? Um, do we go with the research? and make the determination that we know that half the community doesn't want this, the other half does, and we make the change anyway. I think we've got some difficulties um, as we move forward, but I think it's healthy for us to figure out what the will of the people are going to be. Um, I want to know, and I know this information was way back and I don't remember it all, but without going back through dark, um, the big piles of, of paperwork at home, but internal impact because we have 950 some teachers that are going to have their schedules disrupted. Because if we make changes, whether they're 30 minutes to an hour, um, that's going to disrupt everybody's work schedule across the entire division. Um, bus drivers won't feel it, but custodial, teachers, paras, lunch, the whole, you know, what, what's, the, what's those internal impacts going to be? I really want to, want to know those. And I guess we'll hear some of those, but I really want those to be factual and data points that we can really chew on. And then external impacts. I know we talked about those. You have some notes about New Horizons down here and, and such, your side lane and the one up the road. But we do have regional programs. Um, I know that Hampton has a later start time. Hampton does. And they work, I guess it works with New Horizons with them. But do we, or should we anticipate any external impacts if, Option C was what we went with. Now, and I just need refreshers on that as a board member. But at the same time, I think the community needs to know some of these impacts also. Um, because the survey on the surface, yes, but it's that collateral damage that may be created or the collateral positives that may come from this. I can't speak to either one because we don't, we're, we're in the infancy stages once again with a, with a subject here. Um, that definitely needs to be explored. I agree with that part of it because that's where we left it off back in 2013. But verdicts out to see what the will of the people are going to be and whether this board's going to make a decision based on research or a decision based on the will of the people or a combination thereof. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Can I, can I have a, just a follow up about what you said? But we're not giving option C and D to the public and saying that it's, we're going to do one of these no, options. That's, that's this right. is just a refresher for what we discussed three years ago. Right. Well, we are talking about researching, well, researching, okay. surveying parents about later high school, middle school start time, but it, whatever it is. But it does right. not necessarily have to be option C or D. It could right. be a new A, B, it could be whatever. Whatever it is, but it, it would be later. That's what we're asking right. them. Well, as I re reviewed the information, there was a, a draft of a survey that was um, that was presented to the board, or I know that was in, in Dr. James's uh, notes. Um, I think we have to carefully review that. I think we have to carefully construct what those questions are and really think about what do we, what are the res what responses, uh, what's the information that we're trying to gather as we construct mm -hmm. those. 
Um, something as simple as I go to what school, you know, I'm in this school or this zone, so we get a rep good representative sample from across <laughs> the school division. Um, so go but, Dr. But George, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. And I'm hoping yeah. that we can, and Cindy made reference to the fact we don't want somebody hitting the, you know, submit right. multiple times. Multiple times. Right. Time. Technology. Um, yeah. Using technology maybe with, maybe with the students are easy to survey because we do those with the schools um, and they collect them up. But the parts of outside the school using technology, maybe there's a way to tie the student ID number to one, apply this it, you know, that you don't get a second, you know, that once it's done, it's done. I don't, I know, I'm sure technology allows for ways to, can, right, to control yeah. that, but that's going to be so important. But what worries me too is what if the Bruton district or my district has a 20% return and TAB has a 92% return. Now we really don't have a true sense of um, of what we're trying to accomplish. So we've got to figure out how to really yeah. get people to do these surveys. And I think it's really important to note that, that the survey is one is another piece of information. So uh, the research is one piece of information. The survey is one piece of information. The RFP regarding the efficiencies of our transportation is another piece of information. So. I think our job as staff is to provide the board with as much information as possible so you can make a well-informed decision. I even think going back in history, when we first started this discussion, even before 13, it was what comes first? Do we have to look at a specific option so that the survey is based on that option so we know what we want people to respond to? Or do we just blindly throw out, do you want to change without knowing which way to go? Yeah. You know, which option to even think about. And that, we spent a lot of time, I think, trying to figure out mm -hmm. which cart, does the cart come before the horse well, or just what? Yeah. And so now I think we're just moving forward to say, we, we're going to make high school later. How do we handle it? And, you know, the Youth Commission, they um, presented us with results of their um, survey they did of students during lunch period, you know, it was just random. Uh, but they, the majority wanted a later start time, but they differed widely on what time they wanted school to start. And there's no way we can uh, accommodate everyone's schedule. But a later start time is not reinventing the wheel. School did start at eight o'clock or later years ago. Budget cuts caused three-tier bus systems around the country. Now the research is out there to show that students would be healthier, both physically and mentally, uh, less substance abuse, less car crashes, and a higher achievement. And so, you know, I think we have to, as Dr. Shandor said, look at all the information. Absolutely. I think a couple things we need, we need to look at. If, if we put the survey out and the survey comes back that most folks are not in favor of it, and we've got to be prepared to make a decision on that. If we if we know something is the best for the student, um, in our mind we have to realize, okay, if it comes back that most people don't want it, what are we going to do at that point? And I think we need to really be careful how we word the survey, how we portray that and explain that to the community. Um, I think so there are a lot of new details too. The state is now reinventing the way high school is to, is going to look. Well. I believe they're taking away the seat time requirement, aren't they? So how will that affect instruction and the amount of um, hours in the school day? Um, as you said, with the RFP, if they look at efficiencies in transportation and new routes, I think there are a lot of um, factors yet to be determined that could help the implementation of a start time. And, and I think the second point, you know, it's. Do we do the education piece first or do we do the survey piece first? And, you know, it is somewhat likely that you're going to get more buy-in if people are educated on it. And the more they know, the more they're going to want this. So, you know, it begs the question, what do we do first? Do we do a little education um, or do we just put the survey out there? So, and in this, we can't discuss, you know, any of the details of that, the cost of any of that or anything. But uh, after we have done that and in and, and closed session and, and talked about that, we can maybe maybe talk a little more about what's what's first. Mm -hmm. I even choice. think staff can come back because, like you say, you've seen sample of surveys and mm -hmm. just to could be a part one and then come back with a part two later. Yeah. But just to get us started, but we're mm -hmm. open to suggestions. And Barbara, just to throw a caution out there because we're getting ready to kick off in the fall a major 
huge component of re, you know a balancing of attendance zone study. Um, yes, this is something we're going to do. I mean, to look at to explore. Um, but I want to. We can't dump it so much on our staff, and so I think that they need to. We need to be. They need to balance too. I mean, they need agree. to have the flexibility agree. to balance yeah. too because. I, I can just imagine how complex a rezoning is going to be. I can think if you take the entire YCSD, that's going to be a huge. That's going to be a huge undertaking. But it's my understanding that's why we're doing an RFP to have a third party come third in. Third party to help. comes and helps, but they don't. But but at the same time, we're still meetings and community groups and committees. And, these people will serve on those committees along with the people that are chosen to serve on the committee. Maybe so, we should form a committee of parents and teachers and um, staff to help lighten the load. For? For the um, school start time issue. I don't know. To help with the education and the survey and any work that needs to be done. I would say done. let's wait. You know, we're yeah, making the decision so now to move forward, but I think we need some more time with staff to decide how we want to move forward with that. You don't want to have a committee explore it? I would just say let's collect some more information. I think as we get the information, as we collect yeah. the survey information, as, we, as again, as we collect all of this information, yeah. that may be the time to bring in folks and to review all decision. that information. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if you put that community together first because there's not a lot for them to chew on versus what we just presented yeah. from 2013. So once we get that information, that may be the appropriate time to do that. This is our first time looking at this since we put it to bed for a while, and now that his his doctor uh, Shandor's feet are completely drenched, <laughs> we move we pick it up and move forward. So I'm not putting out that option. I just can't say I'm ready for that right now. I was just offering it as a way to help staff. If I didn't want. There's never going to be a perfect time. There's always going to be a crisis. There's always going to be an issue that staff's going to have to deal with. And um, it's either we hire more staff if, if we're overrun with the day-to-day -day operations and the school and, and everything that we want to do to move YCSD from good to great. I think that's the mission that we're, we're trying to, to provide the best opportunity for all students and to move our school division from good to great. If they're short staffed and you, you need an extra body, I was offering maybe a committee could help. I would argue we're already great. We've got a high functioning school district and we want to go from great to greatest, um, not good to great, but that's, that's my opinion. Um, but yeah, we can see where it goes. Um, well, I think we're, uh, Anybody have any more questions, comments on this? I think we're moving in the right direction. I think, um, uh, you know, with the other things that are going on, um, the rezoning and, and those types of things that we're talking about, rebalancing attendance zones, uh, yeah, this is a, these topics sort of go hand in hand, and uh, I think it's a good time to to really take a good close look at it. And I think it's what we're doing, so we're moving forward. Super. Um, all righty. Thank you very much uh, for that information. Dr. Shander, take us into our next. All right. Thank you, Dr. George. I'm going to ask Mr. Shearhart if he'll please come to the podium, Associate Director of Capital Plans. He's going to provide information about projects that are included in the Capital Improvement Plan for FY17. The alignment of the projects will be the focus of this presentation. Mr. Shearhart. Thank you very much, Dr. Shandor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Shandor. Uh, on the screen there, you see a selection of projects that we have uh, reorganized for FY17. These are based on some funds that have become available. Uh, and so therefore, we are moving the uh, Tab Elementary School project for HVAC equipment and controls back into FY17. Uh, so we had that four 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 million fifty thousand dollars there for that project, and we have also moved into FY17 the Tab Middle School. I mean the Grafton Middle School, Grafton High School, retaining the entire building for two hundred sixty thousand uh, dollars. Adjusting these projects into FY17, we still meet the goal of the nine million dollars uh, for the uh, uh, constrained budget uh, amount that we have. All the rest of the projects on this list are in the original location they were in the CIP that you had approved previously. 
So the only two projects that have moved to Tatt Elementary School and Grafton Complex, Grafton Middle School, High School. That's great that we were able to move those two back. Mm -hmm. Yes. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so this is a good one. No, as long as we get it done. <laughs> <laughs> CLP has definitely been in flux lately. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. yeah. Safer. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Sherr. Thank you, Ms. Sherr. One final item this evening, certainly no less important. Dr. Sander, would you take us into that, please? Thank you, Dr. George. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Jarrett. Uh, he's now going to share some information pertaining to adjustments to the FY17 school board operating plan. Well, we've come a long way. We started this process back in December, and we started working at, with some preliminary numbers on the FY17 budget. And over that period of time, you've had public forums, you've had public hearings, you've had work sessions, numerous work sessions. And also since that time, uh, the Board of Supervisors has approved a budget for the school division. And they approved that budget on May the 3rd, I believe it was. And um, so now you have the, the solid numbers from the state. You're working with good projections at this point from the federal government. And now you have the local projections. So we're really tonight ready to discuss possibly uh, what you would be approving on May the 23rd as the final adjustments to the FY17 budget. So what we have for you uh, is a draft, or if you will, a recommendation from the superintendent on various budget adjustments to accommodate a reduction that we have in the local contribution. You requested $1.1 million increase from the Board of Supervisors. You ended up with a $365,000 increase. That's about a seven-tenths of a percent increase. Okay, so now we have a shortfall of $762,000 out of your budget. And so what we want to present to you tonight are various items that have been discussed in terms of how we might balance that budget to, to take into consideration the reduction in revenues. This was a difficult process. I, I, know, I know we've talked about this already, and this has not been an easy thing to do. There's been so many options on the table of how we might approach this, uh, but unfortunately, when you think about your FY17 proposed budget, it really, there's, there's two main components to it. Compensation, you put most of your increase in compensation and in mandated cost. We had a huge amount of mandated cost with Virginia Retirement System and with special education. So when you look at those areas there, that's really what, the only thing you had to work with. So let's take the mandated cost off the table. You have no choice with those. So what's left is compensation. And it, uh, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of places to go in compensation. Just to refresh, we, uh, in your proposed budget for all staff, you included uh, all full-time benefit eligible staff, a current step. On the current pay plan, one current step. You also included for teachers a six-tenths of a percent increase. Okay, so those, that step and a 0.6 tenths of a percent increase for teachers equates to a 2%. You also included for all staff what we called a restored step, and that was a restored step for any staff member that had lost four steps, okay? So that's it. That's, that's, that's what you offered uh, in terms of compensation. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but that added up to 3%, which, you know, it wasn't too many years ago when the number when the percent was zero. Uh, we were doing no increases because of the recession. So a 3% increase was a substantial bump, and it would have been in line with what you had done last year. Um, when you look at this, it's very difficult to find a way to balance this budget out and not address compensation increase. Uh, because if you look at the first number on the sheet, item one, it says eliminate restored step for all eligible staff that have lost four steps. That was had a cost of $908,000. You can see that's pretty close to that $762,000, about $145,000 difference. Um, to make up $762,000 outside of compensation, you would literally be going into the budget that you have right now with items that you didn't even put in as increases, you just wanted to hold the line on. 
So uh, what this proposal or what this recommendation brings forward is one way to balance the budget is to go ahead and reach, um, eliminate the restored step for eligible staff that have lost four steps. That saves $908,000. If I can move on to items two and three, um, if item two is we, we instituted a new telephone service this year, this fiscal year. And as a result of that, we now have almost eight, nine months of experience with that phone, new, new phone contract. So we're able to save $50,000 with that new phone service contract. Um, so that's put on the table as another item that will help us balance this budget. Another area we can look at is as a part of that new phone contract, we also bought new phones that sit on people's desks throughout the division. We bought those under our lease purchase program. So one of the things we're looking at is paying off that lease purchase, which would then free up $70,000 in the operating budget. So those two items would be other ways of generating uh, funds to uh, balance the budget out. Now, items four and five are actually adding expenditures, okay? Item four adds one replacement bus. That would bring the total replacement buses to three because you had already put two in the budget, um, and then two increased budget, two increased uh, buses. You already had three in the budget uh, as the base. You were adding another two in. Now this makes a, uh, a total of three being added. And then number five is you're adding textbooks and materials for $175,000. Now what's important about those two items is they're being put in as a one-time expenditure. The recommendation is they go in for FY17 designated for those two areas. Why that's important is if they're designated as one time, you then are making the public and staff aware that in FY18, you may come back and recapture those funds. And if you recapture those funds, you might be looking at compensation with those dollars or you might be looking at something else. It doesn't, we don't know where we're gonna be at that point in time, but it does provide some flexibility for the board when you get into FY18 because essentially you have uh, roughly $265,000 to use towards your FY18 budget if you choose to pull that out of those two line items and put it somewhere else. Um, so that's a positive from the standpoint of your, I kind of think of it like a savings account, if you will, because what you're doing is you're putting money in savings, but you're going to spend it on a one-time basis, but it's ongoing money. So in FY18, when that money comes back, then you'll be able to put it somewhere else. So you're essentially building yourself a little bit of flexibility as you move into 18. Um, so that is, in a nutshell, that's the proposal. It is, we don't have a, a lot of areas to go at um, to make the reduction. The, the one that probably stands out and the one that you have the ability to make a change for is the, uh, to eliminate the restored step. And I have to tell you, as, as the chief financial officer for the organization, and Dr. Shandor and I can, he can attest to this as well, we struggled with this. I mean, we worked a lot of different scenarios trying to figure out how we could maybe save part of the step, prorate the step, do a number of different options. And unfortunately, when you get into those discussions, there's negatives associated with those. And so when we looked at the negatives associated with all those options, we really could not, could not find our way to bring those recommendations to you tonight. So I would open it up for any discussion. Dr. Shander, what did I leave out? What would you like to add? <laughs> realistic, right? <laughs> yeah, it's about as realistic as it can be. I think, again, to echo Dennis's comments, we, we did struggle with this. Um, we spent a great deal of time on this and really diving down and um, scraping through all the books to figure out how can we make, uh, how can we make that restored step happen. Uh, and then reality hits us and, and, and we can't. There's no way for us to do that this year. Um, but I will say, when I look at our budget, um, it's not on the screen, but when I go back and look at some of the things we were able to, ta to tackle, I think it's important because they're all areas of need for us. Um, raising uh, the hourly rate for some drivers. I mean, that's how James gets his staff members. That's how we get full-time drivers. Is That's how we recruit them to get them to come in. We raise, so we raise that. Upgrading our cafeteria managers, managers to pay grade. 
increasing the hourly rate for summer maintenance and cu custodians, which was inc incredibly important for us to address that. Increasing the substitute daily rate. We did that by $5, which is, I think, $98,000 in our budget. For this whole year, we've had conversations with some of our staff members in this room about the difficulties it is to get substitutes. Um, so I think that's a really good strategy for us to be competitive with other surrounding districts. Um, also, one small one would be increasing homebound teachers hourly rate. That's an item, too, that many in the community may not think about, but we, we have students who receive homebound services so to be competitive. So I did want to throw out some, some things that we are targeted and strategic about where we're spending those dollars. Um, again, it's unfortunate that we're not able to close that significant of a gap, but um, I feel good about the adjustments that we've recommended to the board. So, bottom line, I think we all are, uh, uh, have some difficulty swallowing, eliminating the step. But bottom line, if we eliminate it, what will our faculty walk away with the next year? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question because um, it's going to depend. It's going to depend on where you are on our pay plan because the, the, every staff member that is full-time and benefit eligible is going to be getting a current step. Now, for licensed staff teachers, that means it's on average of 1.4%. That's average. Some teachers will get more than that because they're on a different step. Some will get less than that. Some will get zero because if you're at the top of the scale, you don't get a step, okay? So you get zero. Now, one thing that will help offset some of that, at least for teachers, is that you've also included a six-tenths of a percent increase in the, in the scale itself. So the scale does float up, so the people at the top of the scale will be eligible or will get that six-tenths of a percent increase, as will every other employee on, this, on the pay scale. Now, that does not apply to the non-licensed employee group. The non-licensed employee group would get a current step, and a current step on average for that group is about 2%. So you can see the differential why the licensed staff gets that 0.6 tenths of a percent on average to make the two employee groups somewhat equitable in the percentage of increase. On both groups, that's an average. If you're at the top of the scale on the non-licensed group, then you get nothing because there is no six tenths of a percent increase, okay, for the non-licensed group. So I, the, the best answer I can give you is it's going to depend on where you are on the scale, but on average, it's a 2%. I'm, I'm really worried about the compression. Yes. Uh, when we had Evergreen come in here, they told us that was our biggest problem. We've been able to restore one step. Uh, it would have been really nice to have restored step four, uh, this, uh, for, uh, restored the step for all eligible staff that have lost four steps, or at least delayed that restoration into 2017. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about if we put off restoring the step until next year and how that works? Yeah. Um, you. you if you let, let's say that we're moving into FY 18, okay, FY 17, let's say we don't do the restored step. Every year during the budget process, that's going to be a decision point. That's going to be something that this board's going to look at based on the resources available. What you're doing with this proposal is trying, you're trying to better your odds of being able to do that in 18 because what you're doing is you're putting aside $265,000 potentially that you could use towards that purpose or for a current step even. I mean, it, it's whatever the environment dictates to us at that point in time. Um, it's the second year of the biennium for the state, FY18 is. Now, FY8, uh, the second year of the biennium of the state um, generally does not provide as, many, as much funds as the first year, but they do usually provide some kind of an increase if it's nothing more than for teacher salaries. So I would want to anticipate or hope that that kind of would continue, but I don't know that for sure. Um, and of course, we don't know what will happen at the local level. But I think it's fair to say that I, well, I can speak for administration. I feel like I can speak for the board, too. That, that's a priority for y'all. I mean, these restored steps are something that you guys have really pushed. You put money with it this year. You were one of the few places that have, that have done that in the state. So you have really made a commitment to trying to make headway in that area. So, Ms. Kursky, I would say to you, 
that I think if you don't do this in 17, it's going to be right in front of you again on 18 as a consideration. And I think that's important because you then, I mean, if you think back when the economy spun, you know, mm -hmm. and went crashing, this board did everything it could through a one-time payment deal, protection of the health care plan over the years. We did everything we could to try to lessen the impact of the paycheck, the bottom line, what was being taken home by our staff. Um, this is unfortunate that we've been put in this position with a 0.7% increase from local that we couldn't do this. I like the fact that conservative, conservatively we are starting out FY18 with a, with, a, with a positive instead of a negative at this point. But another thing that concerns me is this impact eight deficit. I mean, we're looking at a $900,000 situation we got to deal with over the next few years, and we're only tackling $50,000 of it this year. FY18 is going to start us off with a challenge in that area. So I think that there's there's things, new elementary school later on. I mean, a lot of different things are going to be coming at this board, but I know that compensation's always our top priority. It's the first thing we start talking about every year. It's the first thing out of the box. Um, we hope that next year when we roll into FY18 that the restored step will just, it's an automatic placeholder. There it is. How much does it cost? And then we'll just see how everything kind of evolves from there. Um, but I like this recommendation because it protects YCSD physically. It helps us starting in FY18 with some of the other issues we're going to have to deal with. And um, I wish it could be more. I, I worry. I one thing, let's clarify, when you say carry over, you've um, said that the replacement bus and the textbook, it's one-time expenses. So if the supervisors and the state, we have the same amount of money next year, then that will be open. That money will be open. It will not be carried over because no, we it's cannot, not carry, it, it, we it, cannot it, carry it's over. It's an ongoing operating revenue that is supporting this right. so that the assumption is okay. if we're not cut by the state or the local government or the federal government, then the assumption is that ongoing revenue continues, which then can redirect those expenditures somewhere else. Okay, I wanted you to yeah. clarify that. Okay, I know that, but good. I was afraid the public would think that we were carrying money over, oh, which we are not allowed no, to do. No, no. Um, now, it's my understanding that the General Assembly and the Governor have approved this kind of, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, a statewide health insurance where school divisions can now join together to reduce their health care cost. Have we explored that? Uh, not to my knowledge, unless Dr. Carroll has done any work in that area. Yeah. We're self-insured, so I'm just wondering if we joined in this state health plan if we would be able to save more money. I would say it would be definitely something we would want to look at. Um, I'm not sure if that's a self-insured plan or not. I think that might be a, you know, full what we would call a fully insured plan, mm -hmm. which carries some implications with it, but it certainly needs to be something we would look at because, you know, there, there, was a, there, was, there is a state pool out there uh, that's out there already, but they're talking about being able to allow us to go into the state plan, mm -hmm. which is different than the state pool that's out there now, which yeah, I think could, you know, something we should look at. When Definitely. would we be able to look at that? Well, as soon as it becomes available in terms of the data. They haven't sent any information out to us yet, but when it does come out, we'll be, we'll be looking at that. Our HR department should be uh, on top of that. I don't know if you've seen any news oh, with yeah. any of your associations mm -hmm. or anything, but we'll, we'll be, we'll, we'll watch for that. I'm because sure. that is something that, you know, the thing of it is, is that when you get into a big pool like that, and if your experience is based on the the experience of the pool, then it can it can fluctuate a lot on a year-to-year -year basis. But if the pool is large enough, those fluctuations don't really have a huge impact. So that's the kind of thing we want to want, want to look at: how many people would be involved in it? Are we really going to be experienced using the experience of the state? In that, and if it is, I mean, it's something that could we, you know, we certainly would. Yeah, I would ask the question: What about the twenty-year retiree benefit that we can have on our health care plan? Would that be continued into a plan that's managed by the state? Well, that would be a question that I have to you know, because the, the, I think really what you're asking is: If you go into the state plan, are they going to also dictate the contribution requirements? Exactly. And if they do, then that would be a whole, whole different idea. But I mean, it, we we need to look at that. That would be something we would definitely take a look. But at. I think you, at some point you have to weigh the cost versus yes, being able yes. to provide pay raises. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. But I think, I'm going to date myself. Remember when VSBA started its insurance program? Yes, I do. And I brought you the packet and says there's something we can be a part of. 
and it was no because of the self-insurance fees. Yeah. And it's been interesting because, remember that? No, Sometimes. Yeah, I'm sure it was a long time. And, and, <laughs> yeah, and it did not, it no longer is that. Carl's still teaching. Oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> you were teaching him. <laughs> but, but that has since gone under. Just That's no longer about program. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. But, yeah, no yeah. I, I tell program. you, e even after that, um, there was a consortium of, it was called Herpesa. I don't know if yeah, Mark, you remember, you the remember name. it was called the Hampton Roads Educational Public. Yeah. That didn't work out too well. And, and yeah. it was a group at the south side and the peninsula. <clears throat> All the school divisions got together. I mean, we're talking Virginia Beach to Gloucester, yeah. Williamsburg, and it was it was like nine or ten of us. And we were going to do a consortium on health insurance, and it just it fell apart because because of the network of providers. But what you're talking about is. A network that's statewide, and that that has a different color to it, a different color altogether. So it's something we want to take a look we'll at. See. Yes, I think okay. this may be part of a larger conversation, just on you know this shared services. I mean, there's there's been talk about the county health health plan and the school division health plan. Granted, we're in two different places right now, but right. there there may be some merit in looking at that. I mean, strength is always in numbers, and when you approach insurance companies, there's no doubt. Um, you know, the more people you have. Uh, represented, um, the better the terms can be sometimes. So I think it's worthy of conversation for maybe a shared service down the road too. Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm yes, okay sir. with that proposal coming before us, amending the, I guess, the present school board budget. Yeah, uh, on the 23rd. On, uh, the 23rd. Monday, yeah, the Monday, yeah so. we'd have a resolution prepared that would adopt this amendment right. to your budget. Well, let's just go down the, the line here and see. Cindy, how are you? Um, I need more time to really look at this. Um, I'm on the fence. Mark. As much as I as as I have a concern, I don't know how else to do this. Do this <clears> thing, so. Right now, unless something drastically changes, unless you find some money somewhere along, I'll but call anything, you. I'll call you. <laughs> between now and the 23rd, you know, but right now, if I have to go with this, I have to. You know, we've been going around, we've, we've been talking about this as a board and, and with, mm -hmm. with you guys. And, you know, going into a year in debt like that with money that's already <clears throat> spoken for, but we've got to find it is something that we, is not customary for the school yeah. division. And I think it's, you know, it's out of our comfort zone. Uh, doesn't mean it couldn't be done. But I think that's the reservation on everybody's everybody's part. Um, if 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 I heard from you, yeah, I think there's this area. If we had to, we could fall back on this and then it happened. But you know, you're you're out of sort of out of suggestions too. I think. Yeah. I mean, there's so, not been so much. Well, I mean, we, yeah, we can, we can we can make something happen real easy. I mean, you, we could pull At numbers out, of something but else. the question is, the question is, what are you going to be comfortable with knowing that you're building yourself a, a liability two years down the road? Because we don't know what's ahead of us. And, um, you know, in these times, I just don't think it's a wise thing to do. I mean, uh, but can you do it? Yes, you can do it. Um, but is it, the, is it the right thing to do fiscally? I would probably have to say no. And Dr. George, if it we didn't have nine hundred thousand dollars hanging over our head with the impact aid reductions we got to deal with. I think that that discussion might have been a little bit more comfortable, but knowing we're kind of already starting out having to deal with a major over time, but we still got to deal with that over the next few years. I think that's going to cost us what three hundred thousand dollars, roughly. For well, that you know hours. that that's a subjective. Could it, yeah. it could be any number because ultimately the board of supervisors has to approve how much they're going to pull out of the of the revenue stabilization fund. This year they authorized nine hundred thousand dollars, and as you pointed out, or Mark pointed out earlier, is that that's only a fifty thousand dollar difference, which is I mean it's a start. But we do have a limited number of funds in this revenue stabilization, so we've got to be working on getting that number down over the next three years. And if you did it over three years, it'd be roughly three hundred thousand dollars a year until you you know work that out. So, using that analogy, then what Mr. Mepford is saying is correct. You're basically going into the hole 
for 18 for 300,000 right off the bat, so you just spent your 265 that you carried over. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of just looking at this. So you're, okay. Well, see, that's what scares me is that try as we might, we still might not be able to do that's this right. in FY18. And I wish there was a way that we could help um, staff who have lost four steps, even if they can't have it implemented until January, February, March of the next year, at least to put them on track so they, they know something. Um, and I'm just, I just keep thinking, is there anything else in the budget? Is there, are there any other savings? You were talking about joint services. Um, are there any services that we could start looking at? We won't be in time for this budget, but to look at for next year. Um, I, you know, I think about uh, the maintenance contract and how expensive that is, and have we reviewed it to see how often they're supposed to cut the grass at the schools. We pay $1.1 million for that. Could we get a third party to cut our grass more often and cheaper and save money that could go into compensation? Yeah, yeah that service is provided by the county, and there's a direct revenue that they provide to us to pay off that contract. So whether or not if we, let's say Dr. James was successful in getting a lower bid to do that work, then the question would come up, would they still give us that funding to offset that? Now, and we don't know. I mean, But, but that funding's but, going but to right. the maintenance, yes. so it's not going anywhere yes. else but that. But you know, as a taxpayer, we're spending more money to yes, have indeed. the yes, grass indeed. cut once a month. Yes, indeed. Somebody's <laughs> paying that bill. Somebody's paying that bill. <laughs> It's either us or them, and I agree 100% that if, if that can be done cheaper, it should be. I'm all for sharing yeah. services, but I'm also yeah. for finding a third party if yeah. it's cheaper than the county. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> you know, looking at this, we were just say we, you know, we tossed around the idea of prorating this, and we'd, we'd come into the uh, FY18 with basically a $400,000 debt if we if we looked at that, and then you say you're up to 265, 300 on the uh, revenue, revenue stabilization, the impact aid piece. Right, I mean, right. you're, you're at 700000 right. right there kind of coming into the FY18. I mean, that's just it's a territory we're just not accustomed to, and I don't think it's good practice. But I share, you know, everybody's concerns, and none of us like this uh, at all. Um, what do you need from us to know? direction? No, uh, just, just uh, if you are in an agreement with this, the resolution we put together to reflect these numbers, and then that will be on your agenda for the 23rd. Okay. 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 We'll go forward. If you Thank get you. anything, find Let anything in your hat yeah, that we'll you can pull out. out. He'll be the first to know. <laughs> please, please. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jarrett. All right. We're in need of a closed session, so if I this could have 29, right? I will bring the York County School Board convene in closed session pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act under VA Code 2.2-37118 to discuss a contract matter. Second. We're going to do the personnel first. Did you want to do the personnel one first? Uh, I did. I think she did. Did you That's what she said. I did the contract. Oh. Contract. I do personnel, sorry. Yeah. I take Thank that you. one back. <laughs> so then we're going to go into it, do this, come out, and then go into another one. Yes. I move that the York County School Board convene in closed session pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act to discuss personnel matters under Virginia Code 2.2-3711A1. Second. A motion is made by Mrs. Haywood and seconded by Mr. Medford to go into closed session to, to discuss personnel matters. And Mrs. Kirsty? Yes. Mrs. Haywood? Yes. Mr. Medford? Yes. Dr. George? Yes. We're in closed session. Uh, I, 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 we you talked session. in the beginning, 20 